So I'll get started. Um, we're by the interesting area here. I'm Trent Whiting with CCAN. Um, we don't grow crops on ground like this typically. We have a little more moisture. I'm northeast of Edmonton. This year we have a lot more moisture. Uh, this is our flax demo that was also seeded over there. This one had a couple seeding issues. Um, can anybody pick up the first one here? I got a couple door prizes in my truck. You'll come see me afterwards. So what what what's the differences we're seeing? Say these first three plots. You might want to walk up to them and just take a look a little closer. Somebody go into it and have a look. Yeah, come come and take a look. Yeah. Door prizes. I heard one there. That's kind of thick. That's too heavy. That's seeding them. It's, it's a plant population issue. That's seeded at double. This one's seeded about a half. And then this one we think is about right. There's another issue in here. You can see it between these two, but you can also, if you walk along the front here and look at this plot, what's different about it? He's different maturity. <laughs> That's the, why? I don't know. Seeding depth again? We're thinking fertility. Notice how it's a lighter green? So we got a maturity issue here where these two rows are maturing faster than the other four rows. Uh, seeding rate's the same, but you can see how it's potted up differently. But it's also a lighter green. It means it's running out of its fertility, or it's probably N quicker, so it's maturing a little bit faster. So it was just kind of, uh, I walked it through this because I found it really interesting. And it shows you what uh, fertilizer can do and then seeding rates. Um, I would never recommend the far one. Um, the weed competition in there, if there was, would be uh, hard to keep up with. I got to watch, I got a mic on, I got to watch how I say things now. I'm not used to this. So that being said, the varieties here are the same as over there. We'll walk over there. Who grows flax? Ken grows flax. He grows flax. I got a question for you. Okay. I'm noticing. I, I'm actually growing soybeans after flax. Okay. And I think I'm noticing some pattern issues from the the straw residue. Have you? Wouldn't surprise me at all. You've heard of that before? Sure. You see that in just about every crop. It's so not it means just a flax thing. No, it's not just a flax thing. We have those rows in our canola at home and our wheat at home. Uh, especially following wheat last year we had very heavy crops and you get the the sea going on where wherever that swath was even with the best straw choppers they don't you get just that spreading it right. just not spreading it far enough trash uh, at least in our world is incredible becoming an incredibly big issue we've seen it in lots of the demo plots this year i've been out a number of times with the alberta ag crew in central alberta um, they're normally going on to a cereal stubble and you it's not good for the plots they're actually thinking about working the ground this fall to try to manage the, the straw a little bit so yeah straw is a real issue you've probably got that it's a little bit later wherever you have your your chaff row yeah you, it's kind of like this you can actually see a color difference and, and a height difference and we thought we even saw differences in nodulation but could be well that especially nodulation uh, you would think that the straw is needs end to break down so you get your microorganisms working harder there mm -hmm. so for sure we'll walk over to the flocks real quick so Mike just told me there's a 10 day seeding difference between over there and here uh, we got a couple things I think going on here where as you move up I think the ground got a little bit harder so we got a little bit different seeding or it was a little lighter and it went in deeper um, sanctuary and glass are our two newest uh, flax varieties Sanctuary is that brown soil zone flax. Um, it's been the highest yielder in the trials. Um, most of these you'll see with the CDC, they're out of the Crop Development Center um, in Saskatoon, uh, along with the brand new one there that looks very thin. Um, it's interesting to see the flax here versus the flax in uh, Leftbridge. Probably six, eight inches more height in Leftbridge, a foot on the cereals. Um, and where they're flowering here, they finished for the most part yesterday. We'll see what they look like tomorrow again. Um, glass is kind of our 
all round uh, Sorel type replacement. Um, it's done exceptionally well under irrigation. Um, dry land, we're growing a lot more flax up my way. I actually saw a field of flax about four miles from our house and the 15 years we've lived there, I've never seen flax. Um, medium maturity, um, good straw strength. This one has probably the best straw strength. Um, for dry land, this kind of the world, I would lean towards sanctuary uh, just because it does better on the brown soil. Questions from uh, seed size and color, uh, Sorel on this side of me, probably the biggest, reddest of the crew. Um, these are more of a Bethune uh, standard type uh, flax kernel. That's easy. Let's go to the Durham. Got some interesting stuff in Durham coming in there. <laughs> so this is our Durham demo. Um, I'm going to start on my right. Uh, we got Marchwell VB. One interesting thing to note on paper through the registration process all five of these are the same height they don't look all the same height here and and part of that is there's no variety there the the varieties react differently under different conditions and you can see what it says on paper and what it does out in the real world in your area they can look a lot different so growing a variety at home um, is my strongest recommendation to see how it does on your farm just don't go by what a piece of paper says be it a tech bulletin be it the the seed guide but the only way to really try a variety is to to bring it home or you know if you got a neighbor growing it take a look at it there but at home trials are uh, by far the best on how a variety uh, will look in your area so marchwell is going to be the very first uh, midge tolerant uh, Durham, it'll be available 2016. Um, its refuge is Raymore, which is the very first solid stem. It's going to look really interested because it's going to have a blend of black ons and uh, cream white ons at maturity. So it's going to have a really interesting look in the field. Strong field is pretty much the standard. Um, Durham throughout the prairies growing uh, both provinces. We won't go to Manitoba because they don't grow much Durham. Um, it's the check in all the trials. 840 and 844. 844 actually was named the other day Spitfire, AAC Spitfire. Um, 840 is a high yielding, just conventional type, uh, 2017. A lot of these, when we get them, uh, depends on where it's at in the breeder seeds uh, process. It could be two to three years before you actually see them out in the field. Um, 844 on paper is the highest yielding Durham uh, that's come through the trials. Good straw strength. Be something to see. Why I like to have the, the trials down here with Ken and the crew is that you get the left bridge site and then you get this site. And, Varieties look so different just in that, you know, what, 70, 80 miles. So it's really good to come out and see how they look here versus over there. When we get to some of the barleys, there's just some real differences. So this is something to look for in the future. Raymore is the first, as I said, solid stem. It's not quite mature enough now, but should be able to pop this open with my thumb. And it's solid, there's a pith in it. You can kind of see the white pith in there. As they mature, it shows up a little bit better. But from the base to the top, uh, for soft fly tolerance, uh, yield on it, uh, about the same as Strongfield. Strongfield's one of the parents. Um, so it's not the highest yielding variety. It, it's right in there with the rest of them. But it's the first uh, insect uh, tolerant variety that we have. As far as tolerances go, um, there's nothing that's truly resistant or resistance, uh, but it's varying levels. This will be the strongest uh, first soft line. Be really interesting when we get the soft light and the midge tolerant in, in one variety. And then Eurostar is a high cadmium. It's a, I think just uh, under contract production through one of the grain companies. But this will be released this fall. 
Um, there'll be good supplies in southern Alberta. We've got a number of our members growing it. I think Greg, wherever he's at, is growing it. So there's, there's a lot of it down here. Questions? You guys are a quiet crowd. I know last year there was um wheat midge topic, and I think wheat midge came in. If, if any of you guys have midge questions, Trent's actually pretty knowledgeable uh, about midge. Yeah, we have enough. There's some midge tolerant uh, uh, hard reds in the front row. Um, this year, the midge map, I think there's a spot in the county of Newell still, kind of that irrigated district where midge is an issue, and then a spot up in the piece um, where before last year they didn't have wheat midge and part of some, not having something is not looking for something and until you look for it and uh, last year's uh, cocoon counts according to Scott Mears were the highest found ever anywhere in the prairies um, so they've had midge in that Flair McLennan country for a while um, but it's like anything else you don't have that problem until you go out there and look for it uh, most of the time it was uh, chalked up as uh, frost damage. It's a colder spot in the piece or on the west side, but yeah, it was wheat midge. Yields up to 50% loss. I had a number of uh, farmers from that area come up at uh, various trade shows going, yeah, we lost 50% of our yields. And it was differences between fields, like a mile apart fields. Uh, some were just really hit, some aren't. So the wheat, orange blossom wheat midge doesn't like to fly, so it'll infest the field. And our rotations of canola, wheat, canola, wheat, canola, wheat, uh, maybe there's two canolas in there, um, are very good for the buildup of uh, insects. I have a question. Yep. So if, if midge is starting to decline in this area, is that a result of the parasitic wasp sort of catching up with the midge as it's moved across the province? I would say that's probably part of it. Um, also, midge, it, most part in Alberta has been, it's kind of a, much more of a cycle than in Saskatchewan. In Saskatchewan, it's kind of got a base level uh, where it goes base to up. Alberta, we've never had it really, really bad. So yeah, I would think it's, it's the parasitic wasp. Um, it's using a bit more midge tolerant wheat. Um, for some reason, Alberta, we're not scared of spraying at night. Um, I know I had a lot of the farmers up from the piece where that they, they were gonna spray at night. Um, and the environment plays such a big deal with it as well. So I think it's a, a combination of things. But we're definitely the last of the... It's kind of moving across the prairies just like Fusarium has moved across the prairies. So right conditions, you could see it. You know, we've had it in my area, kind of that tow field Athabasca. Uh, two years it was really bad and then it just dips. And typically it dips when you, you dry out. It'll be the same licensing then, similar to the uh, midge tolerant wheats then? On the midge tolerant, uh, yes, they'll all be the same. On something like Raymore, there's no, it's just the uh, just like <coughs> the conventional. Okay. Yeah. With regard to durum management, and particularly irrigated durum, have you had any experience with the growth regulators here? I have not. Um, I, and I don't know if the wheat commission, if they're doing much funding, I see a wheat commission shirt over there maybe won it but uh, with i know they're working with uh alberta ag on the hard red and the cps's i don't know if they've done much work with the plant growth regulators on the durham i know lodging is an issue and that's what you'd be using it for ken do you know there's been much work i don't think there's been any durham work done yet yeah no. it, it you know if it works on uh traditional wheat you know cps and hard red there's no reason it shouldn't on a durham I've seen growers that had good success with it, but I just wondered how general it was. There's more plant growth regulators used down here, and I think a lot of it's the spill out from the potato industry um, and the irrigation. Uh, in my part of the world, it's maybe the last two, three years where people have started looking at it. Uh, it's another tool in the toolbox. So as you can see, there's a lot of varieties here. Give you a little bit of background about CCAN. Uh, CCAN's Canada's only not-for-profit uh, association. Um, we're actually Canada's largest uh, seed company, uh, predominantly in the cereal business, but we have got involved in the soybeans in the last few years. Um, a lot stronger in uh, eastern Canada than the west. As soybeans are kind of moving west, we're also involved in it. 
The majority of our varieties will come out of Canadian's public uh, breeding uh, programs and over our 30 plus years of existence we've put about 80 million dollars back into the public breeding system here. This is our newest soft white. Um, comes out of Harpinder's program in Leftbridge. Uh, we don't have breeder seed until this fall, everything going together. So it'll be a 2017, uh, I think, commercial launch on it. That's why it's still a number. Um, it's an improved Sadash, and if anybody's growing Sadash, it's hard to beat. So it'll be interesting to see how it goes along. Um, it's going to be a little bit taller than Sadash, but the straw strength is supposed to be as good or better. I'm going to skip a lot of these as we go because there's just too many and we don't have all day. Uh, the four KWS varieties in here um, are more for interest sake. We're just taking a look at them, kind of comparing them to our stuff as we go along. Uh, from what I've seen on them, uh, they're out of England. They're very late maturing. They're very late to head, even in Leftbridge. Actually, they're just starting to head right now. Um, I've got a site just north of Edmonton. Uh, I was there on Monday. They were just, just starting to head. Actually, one of them was still in the flag. So they're a little bit late as far as I'm concerned, but that's kind of one of the reasons we have them in here to take a look at them. Past year would be the closest thing to the four PW or uh, KWS varieties. Um, past years actually out of the Netherlands. And you can kind of see how all five of them have a little bit different look to them than everything that way is out of the Canadian breeding programs. Um, past year is very late. Yeah, it's general purpose, uh, high yielding, but you know, it's kind of soft white plus for maturity. It does, past year is unique in that it seems to have a little bit of daylight sensitivity to it in that in my world, it actually matures kind of like a hard red. Um, in Manitoba, it matures like down here. It's a week later than most of the hard reds. So moving it into the U.S. actually out of Manitoba <laughs> as a milling wheat. So it's kind of a unique one. Behind me is CDC Haymaker. It's a CDC baler replacement. Uh, out of one of the last out of Dr. Brian Rossnagel's program uh, before he semi-retired. Um, in Lethbridge, it's taller than Murphy beside it. So there's one of the ones where you can really see a, a regional difference in a variety. One of the knocks on Baylor was the grain yield. Um, Haymaker's got improved grain yield. Basically, it's the same beast after that. Forage yield, about the same. Huge wide leaves um, and very late maturing. So from a grain yield standpoint, there's way better ones to, I guess, my right. Uh, but if you're in the forage business, it's uh, going to be a big forage uh, yielder. Comes out this fall and there is seed available, or our members down south do have some. Three, I think all three, new CPSs in a row here. This one was named actually a couple days, about a week ago. This one is AAC Penhold. It's going to be an AC Foremost replacement. Uh, AC Foremost is the most widely grown it and 5700 uh, CPS wheats. Typically up my way, they're more moisture loving crops. Short, strong, strawed, uh, improved protein and yield over uh, Foremost. And you can see here, it's it and Foremost are probably the two shortest. Past year will elongate more. Same with the KWS varieties, they'll elongate a little bit more over it. This one will be released. Uh, next fall for spring 2016. On this side of me is HY 1610. It's going to be our midge tolerant CPS. Um, it was the highest yielding CPS to come through the co-op trials uh, when it came through. Proposed name on it is 4AVB. It's unique and so far I've seen it's got a kernel that looks just like a hard red. Actually both of these do. Um, so this these are some of the offspring of our getting away from the KVD, the kernel visual distinguishability, um, where CPS had its own big seed and hard red had a small. These ones are more kind of in-betweeners. This one has that one as a refuge. In the field, this one would be here. Normally this one's about here for height, but as you can see, the 
lack of moisture here putting them all about the same. Riley will be available this fall. Um, high yielding, kind of a crystal replacement. Um, again, in my world, crystal's actually taller, but you get down here. I think what it is, it's actually handling the drier conditions a little bit better, so that's why you're getting a little more height out of it. Um, very high yielding. It stood up for the growers got it. Uh, Alan Dick has some at uh, Rosemary. Under irrigation, it stood up for them. So that was one of my concerns was the straw strength, what it was going to be like under irrigation. So far, so good. Anybody want me to talk about the oats in the back as we go along? Most of them are milling oats, kind of eastern prairies, other than, say, Morgan. Stride. Stride should be as tall as Murphy. Short here. Like that, those are exceptionally short for oats. Lillian, solid stem, semi solid stem. These are our midge tolerance. Um, Shaw, widely used Shaw, um, has harvested as one of the parents, so good grade retention on it. With moisture, it can get very tall. We'll just keep going. This is a brand new one, the uh, Unity Vesper type replacement. Too early to tell where they're gonna fall out. Let's see. CDC Kinnersley in the back. A very early maturing malt. And I think you can see that here where it's uh, starting to turn faster than everything else around it. Um, improved straw strength. It's basically an improved AC Metcalf. Um, it's traditional type protein like Metcalf. Uh, the malting profile on it is Metcalf, uh, but in an early maturing. So in that early maturing belt, kind of west along the mountains uh, for Durham, um, it, it looks pretty impressive. And about a 6%, kind of a CDC Copeland type yield. Redwater, AAC Redwater, will be commercially available. So the first hard red in the line I'm going to talk about, I think. Again, it's uh, the earliest maturing of all of our wheat in the lineup here. Typically, it's the same height as Stetler, which is on one of these sides here, over there, I think. Um, it, in Lethbridge, it looks like Stetler, but again, it's uh, maturing quicker down here. Um, it's the earliest maturing with some fusarium tolerance. That'll be really interesting for down here. Um, we've got a number of CCAN members in southern Alberta growing it under irrigation, so there'll be commercial seed available uh, this fall, or should be, everything being equal. Let's see what I got on the back. Yeah, so here's Stetler here. You can kind of see how they're a lot deep. Stetler, all of these. I guess five here or six are later maturing, kind of medium late for maturity. Uh, Stetler's been grown widely in Alberta. I guess uh, crop insurance numbers put it as the number one wheat last year, uh, hard red in Alberta. Um, the BW487 is kind of looked at as a replacement, and the BW472 is kind of a replacement for Carberry branded. Uh, Carberry's widely known uh, with the good fusarium tolerance and good spandability. Brandon's an improvement in yield over Carberry. Uh, Brandon will be available this tall, and again, we get a number of CCAN members down here uh, growing it. Uh, short, strong straw, and you can tell all of these are a little bit shorter, especially the Brandon. I think Carberry's two over. Um, you know, very short, very strong straw. Questions? Anybody grow six row barley? Well, you might want to in the future. Amisk is in behind. Uh, big knock on six rows is that they uh, aren't consistent in their plump. Amisk is a new one out of uh, Alberta Ag and Lacombe. 7% uh, higher plump than Metcalf. AC Metcalf's the check in the tests. AC Metcalf's a two row. Um, it's really going to be different than all the six rows before it uh, because of that plump uh, yield. You can see it. I got it beside Vivar because it's short, strong straw like Vivar. It's a semi rough on. Um, it's not 
as rough as say Vivar, but it's not smooth like Chigwell. It's somewhere in between. Uh, short, strong straw. We're doing a one year release on it, so there'll be seed available this fall. We've got a number of members in Southern Alberta with it. Uh, we think it could be that irrigated or dryland uh, six row. So something to look. And it looks, I was in a field of it yesterday um, under irrigation and it was that tall. And I'm like, that's not semi-dwarf, but it's semi-dwarf here. I guess the other one in this row that I really want to talk about is CDC Maverick. And I'll walk back to it. Am I okay to talk from here? So CDC Maverick is actually a selection and the cross out of CDC Cowboy. CDC Cowboy was the low input, slow fertility, um, low grain yield or lower grain yield. Um, it seems to under dry land though, it'll even out. It handles moisture or lack of moisture way better. Rough on though. Maverick is smooth on and it truly is a smooth on version if you want to try it. Other than that, it's CDC Cowboy. Um, we've got a num number of members down here growing it. It's the, I guess, the perfect dry land feed in that it does convert to the little bit of moisture it gets better and the lower fertility. Plus it's a good silage and the grain yields aren't bad under those dry conditions. You can tell it's taller in, in Lethbridge. They're that tall right now with the moisture they have there, both of them. Um, Besides something like Pinocchio there, there's like that much height difference. But yeah, it'll, it'll be available this fall. Any questions? That kind of brings me to the end. These are the hard whites here. Um, hard whites have been a little bit harder sell um, in the marketplace. The marketplace would like them as far as the millers. They make smart breads and things like that. Um, they were much more readily accepted under the old wheat board regime in that the wheat board was taking money from the reds and using it to funnel the market development work in the whites. Um, they're good varieties. They're a little bit maybe smaller seeded, more traditional smaller seeded, but they're kind of slow, going slow right now. I've got a couple of, we're, there's a couple of mills in Canada that are using them a little bit in the States, but we're a volume producer and we'd much rather produce and market the reds versus the whites right now. So they're a, they're a work in progress. With that, there's no questions. Thank you for asking me to come out today. Um, I'll be around the rest of the day. If you think of something, feel free to ask. Maybe join me in thanking Trent. <laughs>